It's after a judge sentenced a man to life in prison for killing his three sons in New Richmond. Prosecutors are now revealing new details about the case that was against Chad Dorman. WCPO 9 News anchor Brett Pagansky shows you why there are still questions about Dorman's motivation. Walking around the house with the Bible mumbling, Chad knows what's right. Chad knows what's right. It's just some of the unusual things Chad Dorman said to family members. He makes the statement that Clayton is going to be the hardest one. Minutes before he killed seven-year-old Clayton, four-year-old Hunter, and three-year-old Chase. The day before, prosecutors describe an interaction between Dorman and his stepdaughter. He wakes her up and tells her and apologizes for whatever I have done to you and for anything I've ever done to hurt you. On Monday, prosecutors outline how they would have tried Dorman for the murders of his sons, showing surveillance video of him at Kroger's little clinic on the morning of the murders. His mother suggested he'd go there. He expressed to her, not to Laura, that he was having some confusing feelings. But prosecutors pointed out he never got treatment for mental illness. When Dorman got home for lunch, more unusual behavior. The defense says to Laura that this will be my last good meal. Laura begins to worry that this is a statement that he may be contemplating suicide. Just before they all took a nap, Dorman told his sons he loved them and they did nothing wrong. Prosecutors say Dorman grabbed a rifle from the safe and the terror that followed. They're all trying to encourage him, telling him that they love him and beg him not to kill himself. Laura takes the phone out to call 911 to get some help there for Chad, who she believes is about to kill himself. He grabs her phone throws it across the room and tells her it's too late. On Friday, Dorman pleaded guilty to murdering his three sons. He'll spend the rest of his life in prison without the possibility of parole. Do we still know why Chad did this? No idea. Don't know why. That will probably never be answered. In Batavia, Brett Pagansky, WCPO 9 News. Well, that's a little backstory on him, man. They said he had a mental illness, but he never seeked any kind of help for it he went up to the store came back he was walking around with a bible telling himself chad you know better you know better told his wife this is going to be my last good meal she thought he was potentially unalive himself but instead he got the rifle and um, got his three sons now when i heard this last year you know i, I just heard about it you know i i I randomly just read different articles and stuff where something, uh, you know, saying cross my path, I'll, I'll look at it. But I never read into it. And then I just seen it pop up and I was like, oh, I forgot all about that. So I decided we're going to talk about this tonight. Uh, Law and Order has a, a thing called, I think, what's it called? We'll, we'll play the video. Let me see. Mr. Dorman's careful execution of the murders coupled with statements he made to law enforcement after they arrived on scene, indicated that he appreciated the nature of what he did, as well as the wrongfulness and consequences of such. You have all now heard the 911 calls and you have seen the body worn camera and you have seen at least portions, if not all of the defendant's interview. During the 911 calls, during the body worn cameras, he is not making the same claims that he only begins to make during his interview when questioned by detectives. You never hear him say, we're in hell. I have to get to heaven. I have to get you to heaven. I see flames, the devil, the devil made me do it. He made no statements that would indicate in any way, shape or form during his slaughter of his children that would show or indicate that he truly was in the throes of a delusion. This was something that we believe he concocted during the course of his interview. So they're saying that he knew exactly what Mr. he was Dorman's doing. There was nothing wrong with him. All right. So we'll go into the, the footage of it because it's about 20 minutes, I think, 20, 30 minutes. My children are and this is the seven shocking details of Ohio dad's execution of his three kids revealed by prosecutor. And it's called Crime Fix on Law and, uh, Law and Crime Network. So I think I'm going to start doing these also. We got the body cam footage and then crime and fixes where they gather all the information for us and we can just go through all of the cases at one time. Now, I know people want me to start doing some young thug stuff. I will. They do have a new judge and I, I, I watch it. I pay attention to it. But 
ain't nothing interesting really happening over there. I mean, we got Woody back on the stand. But I'll start doing that because that is, I mean, that is big in the algorithm. It might do something for the channel. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't hit that like button. But let's go ahead and jump into this crime fix. What up, Tamika? A chilling 911 call from Laura Dorman, the mother of Clayton Hunter and Chase Dorman, who desperately tried to save her little boys from their father in June of 2023. And to emphasize the great sorrow we have for this family and how this was this was something out of the blue. This was light from a blue sky. The prosecutor laying out the investigation and trying to answer the question. Was Chad Dorman actually suffering from mental illness when he murdered his little boys? I'm Anjanette Levy. Welcome to Crime Fix. The prosecution team in Chad Dorman's case is revealing new information about the investigation into the murders of those precious little boys, Clayton, Hunter, and Chase Dorman. I'll outline that new information from the prosecutor shortly. But first, Dorman's guilty plea to the premeditated murders of his three young sons, seven-year-old Clayton, four-year-old Hunter, and three-year-old Chase, on June 15, 2023, came just last week. That guilty plea coming just days before a hearing was scheduled to take place that would determine whether or not Chad Dorman was actually suffering from a serious mental illness that would have barred prosecutors from pursuing the death penalty at trial. That hearing on whether Dorman was suffering from a serious mental illness was canceled after a plea agreement was reached behind the scenes. As to count one, uh, aggravated murder in violation of 290301A, an unclassified felony, how do you plead? Count two, aggravated murder uh, in violation of 290301A, an unclassified felony, how do you plead? Guilty. Count three, aggravated murder in violation of 290301A, an unclassified felony. How do you plead? This case, of course, all started on that beautiful summer day in 2023. It was June 15th when Chad Dorman returned home early from work and was acting oddly. Court documents claim that Dorman grabbed a Bible and walked around his house mumbling, Chad knows what's right. His wife, Laura, told detectives that Dorman tried to get into the gun safe in their master bedroom. And she told him that he was scaring her and that she didn't like what he was doing and she was going to call his parents, to which he responded that he was just kidding and playing around. Laura didn't want Chad to be alone, so the prosecutor said she and the three boys laid down with Chad for a nap. All three of the boys. Yeah, you don't play, I don't even, I use guns, but I don't play around about going and getting no gun or nothing. You got to assume if anybody's talking about going and get a gun, they're going to use it. She, man. I know she thought she was doing right. That's fucked up. That's messed up for real. And they went in there and took a nap. She like, all right, let's try to keep this dude cool. Damn. Yeah, but. Talk about, I'm just playing. You just playing, trying to get in the gun. Like. She should have just left. She, forget calling the parents. You got to call the police at that point. And I'm not an advocate of calling the police. Joined him in the master bedroom for a nap. At some point after lying down with the four of them, the defendant got out of bed, opened a gun safe that was next to the bed, removed a Marlin Model HC-22 uh, rifle from the gun safe and loaded the magazine. The defendant shot his son, Hunter Dorman, twice. While in the bedroom, his wife, Laura, began to render aid to Hunter and yelled for the other children to run. Laura's 14-year-old daughter, Alexis, who had been watching television in the family room, made her way to the master bedroom and witnessed the killing of Hunter. Alexis immediately began to run and indicated that Chasen had fled out the back door. Chad Dorman hunted down Clayton and shot him and then chased after Alexis, who was holding little Chase in an effort to protect him. Laura Dorman tried to protect Chase, too, even suffering a gunshot wound to her own hand as she put her thumb over the barrel of the gun. But Dorman shot his youngest son anyway. Stand up! Damn. 
The sister tried to save the youngest one, put her hand over the barrel, got her thumb shot off. See, it's just a little, it was a, it was a little 22. So her body could take a 22, but the kids couldn't take no 22. She shot, he shot the, the first one two times. Chased the other one and shot him and she grabbed the little one and tried to get out of there. See, I didn't know all the, the details. I just thought he was in the house and he unalived his children. No, I guess when he shot, I guess when he shot the first child, she told the other ones to run. So he just chased after the because he didn't he didn't unalive the daughter either. He was just trying to get rid of the sons, it seems like. Because the sister survived. All she did was get a shot, was a, a shot to the thumb. So I don't know what this dude was on, why he wanted to get rid of the boys. Because he didn't finish the sister. Damn, we'll never know why he did this either. Deputies arrived and took Dorman into custody. He didn't resist. Oh, so this is one of the other, this is one of the children over here. Because there's one in the bedroom, he chased one, and then the sister had another. I know back here further in the driveway, there was a um, it was a blurred out mark. So maybe the sister made it that far. The first kid made it here. My life. What? what are you doing, man? Hey, are you copying all this? Can I roll over? I ain't gonna hurt you. I ain't gonna I ain't gonna hurt nobody. You got anything on you? No, I ain't got nothing, man. Phone, that's it. I'm mad, I ain't, I ain't nothing. Just make sure that dog don't come out. I don't think he'll bite you. Just don't reach for him and try to grab him and pet him. Right. He won't bite you. What's going on, man? Nothing. Uh, can I stand up? It's kind of uncomfortable. I'm going to get I ain't you gonna here do in a second. Away. You can do whatever you want. Now the prosecution team is revealing more information about what was going on in the lead up to the unthinkable murders of Clayton, Hunter, and Chase, three innocent little boys who should still be here. The murders of Clayton Hunter and Chase Dorman, it's one of the saddest cases that I've ever covered, but it's an important case for many reasons, and we want to tell this story in a way that honors their memories. We're able to do that because of sponsors of Crime Fix like Morgan & Morgan. Morgan & Morgan is a law... All right, that was a good transition right there, but man, we don't need no advertising right now. We need to get straight to it. Crime Fix. Claremont County Prosecutor Mark Chicalvi outlined what happened in the days leading up to June 15th. He said the Saturday before, on June 10th, Chad Dorman told his wife, Laura, to take her 14-year-old daughter out shopping so they could spend some time together. Chad Dorman took Clayton, Hunter, and Chase to a dirt track. Photos from that day remain posted on his Facebook page. The next day, that Sunday, he took the boys fishing. There had not been any reports of domestic violence between the couple, and for all intents and purposes, prosecutors say they were happy. Chad worked for the Insulators Union, and Laura was a stay-at-home mom, homeschooling Clayton and taking care of Hunter and Chase. That week, on Monday and Tuesday, Chad Dorman went to work, and his co-workers didn't note any odd behavior from him. Tocalvi said there were conflicting statements by Dorman about whether he was having trouble sleeping or not in those days. Wednesday, June 14th, 2023. The defendant uh, wakes his stepdaughter up before he leaves for work, which is a highly unusual thing to do. He typically left for work at four or five in the morning. Uh, he wakes her up and tells her and apologizes for whatever I have done to you and for anything I've ever done to hurt you. Again, unusual, but will become meaningful in context as we know how the events unfolded later. Go ahead, please. It sounds like you may have been messing with the daughter. Again, he's at work. And these are coworkers, bosses, were all interviewed extensively by law enforcement. Uh, by the members of Claremont County Sheriff's Office, and they report nothing was observed unusual about Dorman on that day. Just normal, normal work day, normal behavior. The night before, Chad 
Norman murdered his children, June 14th, 2023. It was normal. He went as he did and coached his boys, or actually coached Ch uh, Co Coach Clayton. He coached third base that evening. The entire family went to the ball game. There were no indicators that anything this horrible was about to occur. Later, some folks did notice that perhaps uh, while coaching third base, he seemed a little distracted, but nothing concrete, nothing you could latch onto to gauge in any fashion what was about to occur. Then came the morning of the murders, June 15th, to call these said Chad Dorman got up to go to work and searched for the song Happy in Hell by Colt Ford on YouTube. Some of the lyrics of those songs say, between happy and hell, that's where I'm living now. I really want to love her, but I just don't think that I know how. Can't give her everything she needs. Can I give her everything I want? Will it be about what I do? Will it be about what I don't? Will it be about what is right? Forget about what is wrong. Will she love the man I am or the man that sings this damn song? Don't know if I'll ever know the truth. It might not ever show. But if I never tell the truth, then she will never know. Am I her shining light or just her darkest day? I wonder if she'll leave. Hell, I wonder if she'll stay. Oh God, I'm so confused. Is it a lie or truth? Chad Dorman left work at 9.30 a.m. to call me says he told his mom he was having some confusing thoughts. She told him to go to the little clinic. Surveillance video shows Dorman walking into Kroger and going to the supplement aisle and looking at the shelves. He then goes to the little clinic counter. He's there for 90 seconds, and then he leaves before anyone ever helps him. On the way home, he stops. The little clinic. So he went to work. Normally, he left at 4.45. He ended up waking up the daughter on this day. He leaves work at 9.30, so it's roughly, what, two hours, maybe, two and a half hours. He goes to the Kroger, to the little clinic. He called his mom. She said, go to the little clinic. Does the, I wonder if the little clinic actually sees people or they may have prescribed them something. But him not being at work at 445 or 5 o'clock, whenever he usually goes, that should have been a red flag right there. Like if I show up to work at 10 o'clock and not 7 o'clock like I'm supposed to, like, hey, Mo, what were you doing, bro? Why are you late? That ain't like you unless you call. Uh, if I was a 16-ounce uh, foot light, it was out to the shed behind. On the way home, the defendant stops and buys a 16-ounce but Oh, man, so he was drinking. The house. The family then arrives from running some errands, and the boys happen to see their father run to say hello to him. Just a normal afternoon or a normal morning other than he came home a little bit early that day. He plays with the boys while uh, Laura makes lunch. While eating lunch, Oddly, the defendant says, says to Laura that this will be my last good meal. Also, uh, he says this during lunch. So while he's home, so he's already been planning this out because he's telling her at lunch, this will be my last good meal. He already had a Bud Light. He didn't go to the clinic. Yeah, he knew what he was doing. He woke her up that morning, so the prosecutors are right. Once they lay down everything, I'll be right back. I'll let this play. Having no information, no idea what Chad was contemplating, Laura begins to worry that this is a statement. That he may be contemplating suicide. Shortly before he kills his kids, Dorman calls his father and makes the statement that Clayton is going to be the hardest one. Takalvi said that Dorman did some yard work and then played with his sons throughout the afternoon. 3.30 to 3.45, he begins to read the Bible to Hunter. He's walking around the house with the Bible mumbling, Chad knows what's right, Chad knows what's right. Shortly before 4 p.m., he gets into the gun safe, leaving it unlocked. Laura says, you are scaring me. Again, highly unusual behavior. And Chad says, I'm just playing around. Our position is he did this to, again, 
allay any fears or concerns that uh, may build up in her about her safety, his safety, or the safety of the boys or Alexis. So he actively deceived her. 4 p.m. He's telling Clayton, Hunter, and Chase that he loves them and they did nothing wrong and that they are the best boys ever. Knowing he's about to kill them. After this, Chad Dorman and his wife and the three boys go into the bedroom with him because Laura is concerned. That is when Chad Dorman jumped up and grabbed the rifle from the gun safe. And suddenly after lying down, the defendant jumps up, grabs the light, the 22 rifle from the safe, and terror fills the room. As Laura is screaming, the boys are screaming, Laura is frightened that he's about to kill himself. He should have. Trying to encourage him, telling uh, him that they love him and beg him not to kill himself, to kill himself. Laura takes a phone out to call 911 to get some help there for Chad, who she believes is about to kill himself. Oh, so she did call 911. See, he must have been doing some weird shit like this before. And it was just like, hey, I'm going to call 911 and he calmed down. So she did try to call 911 when he grabbed the gun. He grabs her phone, throws it across the room, and tells her it's too late. He's not going to kill himself. It is too late to save those boys. And then what I can only imagine, well, I can't imagine, takes the, the, the rifle, points it at Hunter, and shoots him multiple times. Laura sees this. Alexis sees this. Clayton sees this. Chase sees this. Laura screams to the other children to run while she tries to render aid. And eventually does call 911 after Hunter has been shot. Hunter was shot in the right arm, right torso, stomach area, and twice in the right side of his head. Laura Dorman hey. calls 911. There are actually two separate calls, but I'm only going to play a brief moment from one of them because it's absolutely awful. She's desperately trying to save her boys as Chad yells, Move in the background. It hurt. Hunter was removed from the house by Laura. Uh, she tried to save his life. When you hear Laura tell him to run, Clayton runs out the back door. The defendant gives chase. Like Alexis runs after the defendant in an effort to save Clayton. The unspeakable bravery of that, I, I, I cannot comprehend. But that's what this little girl did. While she's running to try to save Clayton, she observes the defendant raises his rifle, fire several shots, striking Clayton from some uh, 50 or 70 yards distance. Clayton's down, and uh, the defendant walks up to him calmly and executes him with uh, two bullets to the head. Dang. So after Alexis sees this, she knows that Chase is still running around crying. She hears him. She runs back into the house to grab Chase. She grabs him, flees the residence, and begins to run across the yard out the street with the intent to go to the firehouse, which is, you know, in close proximity. To, uh, to protect him. That was Chase's older sister, Alexis, saying, please don't shoot me on a neighbor's security system. Three-year-old Chase tried to hide from his father. He runs to the trash cans in the driveway and attempts to hide from the defendant, three-year-old boy hiding from his father. Alexis runs to get help. At some point, uh, the defendant puts, points the gun at uh, Chase's head and fires it, but the magazine is empty, so it's just a click, as I said the other day in court. At some point, he reloads Laura, protecting Chase, physically fighting with the defendant. 
I said it, and as you're aware, he, the defendant bit Laura in a desperate attempt to save Chase. She places her thumb over the barrel of the rifle and took that projectile in an effort to save Chase. Uh, but unfortunately, the defendant was not to be deterred. Uh, he prevailed in the struggle, had control of the weapon, and uh, executed Chase in front of Laura. Damn. So Hunter was unalived in the house. Clayton got chased down. And then Chase, he was trying to hide. The sister was going to go to the fire station to get help. But he was looking for Chase. So she came back. She tried to stop him from shooting Clayton. Man, the sister was doing all she could to try to save these boys. Damn, I, I did not know all of this happened. So the little boy is three years old, like hiding by he, he don't know no better. Hiding behind the trash cans is like. Damn. I commend the sister, though. She was doing all she could. Lost her thumb. Damn, this is. Takalvi described how Dorman laid Clayton and Chase's bodies next to Hunter's in the yard as their mother tried desperately to save Hunter. Dorman is then taken into custody, and he acts as if nothing has happened. What are you doing, man? Hey, pretty top, you know, man. Can I roll over? I ain't gonna hurt you, dude. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna hurt nobody. You got anything on you? No, I ain't got nothing, man. Phone, that's it. I'm mad. I ain't, I ain't nothing. Just make sure that dog don't come out. I don't think he'll bite you. Just don't reach for him and try to grab him, Petty. Or I ain't gonna bite you. What's going on, man? Nothing. Uh, can I stand up? It's kind of uncomfortable. I'm gonna get I ain't you gonna here do nothing. I'm running away. You can do whatever you want. To Colby then said that Dorman made statements while in cuffs, admitting to the shooting. Tell them I did it, take me to jail. And there were other things that Dorman also said that made prosecutors believe that Dorman was fully aware of what he had done and that it was wrong. Among these statements, uh, the defendant made to the, to the detectives, Detective Mike Ross and Mike Green, uh, that because Laura tried to stop him from murdering these boys, that he should have killed her first. Do you remember your wife trying to stop him from shooting you? Yeah. Prosecutors say this is important because Dorman would later claim he was not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. But prosecutors say Dorman has never been diagnosed with mental health problems in the past. One of the things that all of the experts considered here is that prior to June 15th of 2023, the defendant was never diagnosed, treated, or prescribed any medication for any mental health condition. The expert hired by defense counsel in this case was Dr. Robert Stenson. The court's expert as to the question of not guilty by reason of insanity, again, commonly referred to as NGRI, um, was Dr. Emily Davis. Um, despite the defense's contention, the experts did not agree on whether or not the criteria of NGRI, um, that the defendant met the criteria for NGRI. Both doctors, both Dr. Davis and Dr. Stenson, indicated that it was likely at the time of the offenses the defendant did suffer from a mood disorder, could have been depression, could have been anxiety, could have been anything or nothing. They really weren't sure. But where the two experts differed was that Dr. Davis opined 
that the defendant did not meet the criteria for NGRI because he did know the wrongfulness of his actions. Dr. Davis specifically opined that with all of the information considered and reviewed, it was her opinion that despite the defendant experienced some symptoms of severe mental disease, that it was her opinion that he continued to know the wrongfulness of his behaviors in the offenses charged. Although some collateral records suggest a delusional thought process that served as motivation, such as when the defendant claimed he believed he was in hell at the time, there are also behaviors demonstrated by the defendant and commentary that he makes around the time of the offenses, which indicated he continued to know the wrongfulness of his actions. In fact, prosecutors believe that Dorman concocted that he was suffering from delusions during his interview with detectives. But if it's big and fresh, then you know what I mean? He said, man, you. Right here. I know y'all don't want to hear it, but this would have been one of those times where firing off a couple of shots would have been okay. Just come around the corner and. He had a weapon next to him. I feared for my life. This is one of those moments where that statement is acceptable. Is he healing? Fucking off. Hey, they thought Hitler was big, dude. Yeah, I'm bashing him. <laughs> and prosecutors say they still don't know and may not. And you see him talking about comparing himself to Hitler. Devs. But if it's big and fresh, then you know what I mean. He said in New Zealand. That's fucking awful. <laughs> hey, they thought Hitler was big, dude. Yeah, I'm matching him. <laughs> and prosecutors say they still don't know and may never know why Chad Dorman did this. Dorman's lawyers had said that he was delusional and in psychosis when he killed the boys. With acknowledgement of the pain and the suffering and the fact that these three beautiful boys are gone, uh, Chad would never have done that, except that he was delusional and he was in psychosis when this happened. All three psychologists basically acknowledge that. Dr. Dreyer acknowledged it. They don't agree on whether it qualifies as long enough for serious mental illness or whether he had some appreciation of the legal wrongfulness of what he did. But the fact is, he loved those boys more than anything. And uh, he was ill, he was sick, profoundly sick at the time. Uh, there's nothing more he can say at this point except that he's sorry about that. He did it, he acknowledges that, he's taking responsibility for it, he can't bring those boys back to do anything to do it. I think he would wish that he stayed at the little clinic for a little longer than he did. I think he'd wish that he stayed at the little clinic for 90 seconds. He didn't even talk to anybody. I mean, we know he got life sentences, but still, man, like, if you're in the jury and you're hearing this, it's like, man, no, dog, no. I guilty. That nigga guilty. In hindsight, he uh, signs there before this happened. Tried to power through it. He wouldn't do that again. It was too late. He couldn't. It was out of control. Anything further on that? No. no. <laughs> Judge cut him Mr. Off. Dorman, is there anything you want to say on your own behalf before I impose sentence? No. The loss of Clayton, Hunter, and Chase is a tragedy that is so horrific, it's hard to find the words to describe it. Losing the boys has shattered the lives of their family members who love them so dearly, including their older half sister, Alexis Skeen, who tried so valiantly and heroically at age 14 to save her brothers. She stared at Chad Dorman as prosecutor Laura Baron Allen read her victim impact statement. I am the person who I am today because of you. And no matter what anyone says, you raised me well, and you gave me an amazing life, and I will forever be grateful for the memories and time you spent with me. Ever since what you've done, my life has been something I would never wish upon any family. It is the most heartbreaking and emotional thing anyone could go through. 
Chad, I miss you and I miss the boys dearly and nothing will ever be the same again because of you. Whenever something exciting happens, I always just want to tell you because I know you would be so proud of me. Softball to me isn't the same anymore because that was our sport and that was the boys sport. You made me an amazing ball player. And whenever I play softball, there isn't one game where I don't think about you. And whenever I get a good hit or I learn a new pitch, I always wish I could tell you because I know you would be so proud of me. And when good things like that happen, it sucks to look on the sideline and not see you be there and for the boys not to be cheering me on like they always did. And Chad, I still work very hard on my grades and I was on the honor roll this past year. And I know for a fact, if you were there to see it, you would be so happy for me because my grades have always been so important to me. Another thing that has impacted me was every single holiday. Waking up on Christmas isn't the same anymore. I don't get excited. I don't even look forward to having presents because it's not the same. I don't get to wake up early and wake the boys up. I don't get to hide the elf. I don't get to do any of the fun stuff anymore because they're gone and you took their lives. And Chad, when you go to bed every single night, I want you to know that when you took those three boys' lives away, you took mine and you took my mom's. Chad, I don't think you understand how hard it is to wake up every day and to see my friends and people around me have siblings and to hear them talk about what they did with their siblings that day or how much they enjoy having a brother. Because deep down, that hurts me so badly and so emotionally because it hurts to know I will never get to experience another day with my three brothers or to make any memories anymore because their innocent lives were taken away so quickly and horribly by their own father, their father who they loved unconditionally and who they trusted more than anything. You probably noticed that Alexis said that Chad Oh man, well, I mean, that's pretty a good stopping point anyway. But I was gonna say, man, you looking at the lawyers, they sitting there like, damn. I mean, the lawyers gotta do their job. You know, you you're gonna defend people that are guilty, but your job is to get that check and to defend them. So I would have been all right with being a lawyer because I I'm taking almost any case, but like to sit there and hear this and know what he did. Like this lawyer over there got to kind of cover his mouth. He's like, damn, it is fucked up. And then this lawyer, he looking around and he's like, man. But he played guilty to all of it. So it wasn't like we had to really do too much of a defense. It was like, hey, I'm guilty. But yeah, that, that's. That's messed up, man. She got to live with that. And the reminder is she ain't got no thumb for the rest of her life. Knowing that her brothers are gone. A reminder that she got shot during this. Well, that's Chad Dorman's story right there. Y'all want to do more of these crime fix here? I didn't know that this story was like this, though. I don't know if we're going to do another one like this, but we'll 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 do some more crime fix. And I'm going to start doing just like little articles that I see, get my commentary on it, play the news articles. And then uh, would I defend someone like this? Yeah, if the if the money is right. Yeah, if the money is right, I'll defend someone like this. I mean... I know he's going to lose. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a job. You know what I mean? I was in the military, so I signed up for people to be on the line. I was on call when they were dropping bombs in Syria. So, I signed up for that. It's no different than a lawyer defending somebody that's guilty. I mean, we did shit. Innocence are on the line. So, 
yeah, I definitely would take a case like this if the money is right. Because what we go to court maybe two weeks, make me let's just say thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, I do. I'll do this case. But I mean, it's terrible though. Like after the case is over with, it's like damn. I don't know. All right. And the last thing we have for this evening is some body cam footage. And this is messed up. Hopefully this one plays all the way through. I don't know what's been wrong with them since I downloaded them. But So that's crime fix. And then we got body cam footage. This one, uh, of course, I haven't watched any of it. But let me see. Let me see. I think in this one, it's another incident at Walmart. But I think this one, he... What did it say? I think he may have, uh, he had got shot. I don't know if they said he shot himself or someone shot him at Walmart, but he ran. All right, so we'll we'll do more of these. And then the shorter ones, I'll start having more videos on this. Like I said, we got, um, next week we got Bel Air, so we'll have Bel Air breakdowns. Then we got Power. So I'll be back on my main channel more. But I want to I wanna put videos on here. You'll see, um,